Ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and all welcome aboard the Eastern Express. On this episode, we venture into the increasingly fraught relationship between Turkey and Azerbaijan, which is now being strained by Azerbaijani oil shipments to Israel via Turkey amidst the ongoing war in Gaza. The special relationship between Turkey and Azerbaijan is being tested in a way that could have significant implications for the region. Turkey and Azerbaijan may still be best friends, but like all friendships, there are bound to be disagreements. The question is, can they navigate this rocky terrain without doing permanent damage to the relationship? Let's take a look at our latest report to find out more. Turkey has been experiencing an increase in the number of protests against the shipment of Azerbaijani oil to Israel via Turkey. The shipments have proceeded despite a trade embargo imposed by Turkish president on Israel due to its military action against Hamas. Despite the ban, Azerbaijani oil continues to be delivered to Israel, passing through the Turkish port of Siyahan. This has sparked outrage among various groups within Turkey, who are now actively protesting the ongoing trade. Campaigners, particularly from the group Thousand Youth for Palestine, have targeted the Istanbul headquarters of COCAR, Azerbaijan state energy company, marking the building with red paint as a symbol of blood. Experts note that Azerbaijan, a close ally of Israel, supplies approximately 40% of Israel's oil needs. Trade relations between the two countries have not waned, even in the face of the current conflict with Hamas. The situation has put President Erdogan in a difficult position. The opposition to Israeli trade, coupled with an ongoing economic crisis, is believed to have contributed to the defeat of Erdogan's AK party in the local elections earlier this year. Following the electoral setback, Erdogan announced a trade embargo against Israel, positioning Turkey as a leader in the stand against Israel's actions in Gaza. However, with Azerbaijan being Turkey's largest international investor through COCAR, and the close relationship between Erdogan with his Azerbaijani counterpart Ilyam Aliyev, it appears that Azerbaijan holds significant leverage over Ankara. And now let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. Turkey and Azerbaijan have been the best of buddies for years. The kind that finish each other's sentences and wear matching friendship bracelets. Their strategic partnership is even often summarized by the catchy slogan, One Nation, Two States. But like any friendship, there's always that one issue that can drive a wedge between even the closest of allies. In this case, that issue is Israel. Public sentiment in Turkey is overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian. This is not a subtle lean, it's a complete diving in the deep end kind of support. Whether it is conservatives or liberals, everyone in Turkey seems to agree that supporting Palestine is a national duty. Erdogan, ever the savvy politician, knows this. His AKP party, after taking a hit in the recent local elections, has doubled down on pro-Palestinian rhetoric. President Erdogan has been vocal, sometimes almost theatrically so, about his support for Palestine. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan is playing a different tune. Baku has close ties with Israel, and these ties are not just for show. Israel has been instrumental in helping Azerbaijan reclaim Nagorno-Karabakh, making them something of a strategic ally. So when news broke that Azerbaijani oil was making its way to Israel, it was like someone spilled the red wine all over Turkey's white carpet. Protests erupted in Istanbul outside the offices of Sokar, short for State Oil Company of Azerbaijan, Demonstrators were accusing Azerbaijan of betraying their Palestinian brothers. There was even an incident where protesters threw rocks at Sokar's windows, which, as we all know, is an international symbol for I'm very displeased with your foreign policy choices. Interestingly, Turkish authorities, who are typically not known for their tolerance of protests, have been oddly lenient. This is likely because cracking down on pro-Palestinian protests will be akin to shooting oneself in the political foot. Erdogan's government has mostly let these protests slide, possibly because they're in line with the government's current pro-Palestinian stance. Azerbaijan, on the other hand, is feeling the heat. President Ilham Aliyev have been trying to manage the fallout, even going so far as to make a statement about the need to stop the tragedy in the Gaza during a trip to Egypt. Sokar, meanwhile, has denied direct sales to Israel, claiming that they're simply fulfilling contractual obligations. That's the kind of explanation that sounds reasonable until you remember that contracts can be renegotiated. 
Azerbaijani officials have accused the Turkish protesters of ingratitude, pointing out that Baku has been a good friend, even distributing oil free of charge to earthquake-impacted area in Turkey in 2023. The tension was reportedly palpable during a recent meeting between Erdogan and Aliyev. Erdogan reportedly brought up the Israel-Palestinian conflict, emphasizing the need for international pressure on Israel. Meanwhile, the official Azerbaijani account of the meeting barely mentioned the issue, instead focusing on the stressful development of fraternal, friendly, and allied relations. Insert the dog meme saying, this is fine while the kitchen is on fire. If Turkey pushes too hard on the Palestinian issue, it risks alienating Azerbaijan, a key ally. Conversely, if Azerbaijan continues to cozy up to Israel, it could face increasing domestic and regional backlash. It's a delicate balancing act, and only time will tell how it will turn out. And now, here to shed more light on the issue is Rusev Husinov, a director at the Tapchupashov Center. Hello, sir, and welcome to Eastern Express. Hello, thank you for having me. So we're kind of trying to explore the relation between Azerbaijan and Turkey after their rift between supporting Palestine and Israel. And I'm wondering if you can tell us how big exactly is that rift going to be? Because traditionally, those are really two, close, two really close countries. Do you think that this issue will actually be able to drive them apart? Yes, you are right. Uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey have been enjoying a special relationship, a unique one, which you wouldn't probably witness elsewhere in the world. And this relationship is based not only on neighborly and friendly relationship, but also on brotherly, as we call it here, ties, bonds. Uh, this is why this motto, one nation, two states, are very much popular in both Azerbaijan and Turkey. At the same time, uh, Azerbaijan's strategic relations with Israel is nothing new. It's been this way since Azerbaijan's very early uh, days of independence uh, in, in early 1990s. And these excellent relations between Azerbaijan and Israel have, over the decades, elevated into the strategic partnership. So for many years, Turkey, which is behaving uh, as a country who is trying to uh, become a dominant, a leading country in the Muslim world, has also ac accepted Azerbaijan's strategic partnership with Israel. However, uh, I understand that with the continuation of the conflict in Gaza, there, there are some um, calls, there are some critical positions in the Turkish society towards Azerbaijan, but not in the political establishment. All right, so what are some of the key factors of uh, Azerbaijan's decision to even strengthen the ties with Israel, knowing that this might drive a rift between it and one of its closest allies? So Azerbaijan and Turkey, as two countries which have been very close to each other, are usually on the same page about almost every subject in the world, but a couple of issues, Israel being one of them. Um, on the one hand, Azerbaijan, as I said, is, is quite close to Israel, which includes the petroleum uh, trade between the two uh, and weapons transfer. Uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, Israel's um, transfer of the state of the art weaponry to Azerbaijan, which uh, became very critical in our triumph in, in uh, the 2020 Karabakh war, is not forgotten. Add to this, Azerbaijan's Jewish community, which has been prospering in this part of the world, safe and sound for almost two millennia. And this community, the members of uh, which has also um, established a very big community of uh, Azerbaijani Jews in Israel, they are also uh, contributing to this uh, strengthening the partnership between Azerbaijan and Israel. So I can I can uh, count uh, some other factors, but these are the major pillars which are holding uh, the the ties between Azerbaijan and Israel. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, 
many people in Turkey, despite their openly pro-Palestine and anti-Israeli sentiments, do know Azerbaijan's position on Israel and have accepted the rules of the game. So, as you mentioned before, uh, the political class in Turkey might have known about Azerbaijan's close relation with Israel for a very long time. However, with the war breaking out between Israel and Hamas, people are kind of forced to choose sides. And I think the awareness of this relation between Azerbaijan and Israel is also brought to the attention of the population within Turkey. So my question would be whether or not uh, this political pressure within Turkey, this domestic pressure, will pressure Turkey to pursue a different type of foreign policy when it comes to engagement with Azerbaijan. You are right. The Turkish authorities are under double pressure. On the one hand, the public sentiments, almost all political group groupings, civil society organizations, most of them are decidedly pro-Palestinian. They are also very much critical of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan's trade with Israel, and also pressurizing the authorities in Ankara to either stop this trade or somehow to also push Azerbaijan uh, further from Israel. On the other hand, Externally, Turkish uh, government should also behave, as I said earlier, as a country which is trying to be the leading uh, nation in the Muslim world. Uh, with, and, and according to this pattern, Turkey should show some um, assertive position on Israel, especially uh, on, on the Palestine, uh, Palestine coast. Um, for many years, as I already mentioned, Turkey has accepted Azerbaijan's strategic interests. Um, and uh, we have to also acknowledge Azerbaijan's nuanced foreign policy. It's not only about uh, being a staunch Israel ally. When you uh, look at the statements of the Azerbaijani political establishment, where they are usually supporting the two-state solution in the Middle East, they are voting usually for the Palestine cause at the UN General Assembly uh, votings. So this is actually more complicated than this. Azerbaijan has a consistent pattern which it follows. And hopefully, despite this domestic and external pressure, uh, also inside of Azerbaijan, uh, both capitals, Ankara and Baku, will, will somehow overcome these problems and be able to maintain these brotherly relations. All right. So a quick question following up on that. How much is this nuance being communicated within the political class as well as the normal citizens when it comes to the pragmatic and very nuanced approach when it comes to Azerbaijan and their foreign policies? Well, in Azerbaijan, uh, it is more or less easier because we are a smaller society. Uh, however, in the Turkish case, it's a, a little bit more difficult because it's a huge country with at least 80 million people with a lot of uh, po political sentiments, different groupings, uh, polarization, etc. Therefore, communicating Azerbaijan's position to different layers of the Turkish society is an important issue. And uh, recently, some people in Turkey, they attacked um, the, the uh, Turkish office of Azerbaijan's oil giant, Sokar, by criticizing it for its petroleum trade with Israel. So you are right. Uh, Azerbaijan has, should, should um, communicate its position more clearly in different Muslim societies, including the Turkish one. Right, you brought up the polarizing nature of the Turkish politics. So I was also wondering whether or not you would characterize uh, Erdogan's kind of highlighting of the situation as maybe something as of utilizing it for his political gain. On the one hand, I totally understand uh, the position of the government in Ankara. But on the other hand, I, um, I also respect how the Turkish side has been. I mean, the political circles the authorities especially, they have been very, very careful in in their approach towards Azerbaijan when it comes to Israel and Palestine. As I said, uh, everyone understands uh, the rules of the game. And it's not only about Turkey. Look, uh, Azerbaijan is not 
um, only uh, conducting strategic partnership with, with uh, Turkey uh, amongst Azerbaijan's closest allies, you can find also um, Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. So um, actually balancing uh, uh, these, these uh, relations uh, both inside the Muslim world and beyond that uh, with, with countries like Israel, Azerbaijan has been uh, accomplishing some, some great achievements. Therefore, uh, it's very necessary to somehow be careful, especially in these turbulent and uneasy times. And again, as you uh, rightfully mentioned, communicating Azerbaijan's position uh, in a more pragmatic and in a more accessible way to different Muslim societies. All right, like you mentioned, this is a very turbulent time and it does require a lot of nuance to understand the foreign policies of these countries and to unpack this situation. So thank you so much for your input and insight and for bringing us that part of nuance to our show. So thank you so much for being with us on Eastern Express. Appreciate it. My biggest pleasure. And now we're moving on to the Eastern News Slash, a series of all the other stories from the East that you don't want to miss. Belgian security services have identified a series of Russian civilian ships suspected of conducting espionage activities in the North Sea. Over the past six months, at least five vessels, including fishing boats, have been detected in the Belgian part of the sea. The North Sea, a vital area for European countries due to its extensive network of data, power and communication cables, as well as oil and gas pipelines, has become a focal point for potential espionage and sabotage activity. Belgian security and intelligence services say Russian civilian ships are spying on infrastructure located in the North Sea. Its investigation has found that it's been happening for years and on a much larger scale than previously known. Over the past decade alone, more than 160 Russian civilian vessels carried out suspicious activities near critical infrastructure in the North Sea on almost 1,000 occasions. Research vessels, cargo ships, refrigerated ships, tankers, fishing boats and even passenger transport vehicles all spy for Russian special services. Belgian security and intelligence services say that this trend of utilizing non-military vessels for intelligence gathering complicates detection efforts. The former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan has made an urgent plea to the U.S. government to intensify its effort to secure his release from Russian prison, as well as the Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershevich. The plea marked 2,000 days since his arrest on espionage charges. The former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan, who is serving a 16-year sentence on espionage charges, widely criticized as politically motivated, has expressed his frustration on the dire need for decisive action in the telephone interview with CNN. His arrest in December 2018 and subsequent trial have been condemned by the U.S. as a mockery of justice. The plight of the Wall Street Journal reporter Ivan Gershkovich, detained in March 2023 on similar charges, mirrors that of Whelan. Both men have been designated by the U.S. as wrongfully detained. Gershkovich is one of two American reporters currently being held by Russian authorities. The other is also Kurmasheva, a journalist who holds dual Russian-American citizenship. She faces up to 10 years in prison on charges of failing to register as a foreign agent and spreading false information about the Russian military, charges she and her supporters deny. Unlike Willan and Gershkovich, she has not been granted the wrongfully detained designation, leaving her case with a lower political profile and fewer resources allocated for her release. Metropolitan Yonafan of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has been released from Ukrainian custody and is said to be sent to Moscow. The priest, who was sentenced to five years in prison last August for supporting Russia's invasion of Ukraine, was freed following an intervention from Russian Orthodox Church Patriarchal. Metropolitan Yonafan faced charges last year for distributing pro-Russian leaflets, making online statements favoring the primacy of the UOC over the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and endorsing the Russian invasion. His sentence was upheld by an appeals court despite suffering a stroke during his house arrest. The UOC, which is subject to the Russian Orthodox Church, announced that Yonafan had lost his Ukrainian citizenship and would soon arrive in Moscow. The details surrounding his release, however, remain undisclosed. 
Serbia has been discreetly stepping up sales of ammunition to Western countries that eventually end up aiding Ukraine. It's happening even though it is one of only two European countries not to join Western sanctions and its people remain rather sentimental towards Russia. Serbia has reportedly sold ammunition worth approximately 800 million euros to Ukraine, facilitated through third-party countries. Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic has confirmed the accuracy of these figures, presenting the situation as a business opportunity for the country, insisting he would not take sides in the war. Serbia, with its gold-era military production capabilities, has been able to produce ammunition that aligns with Soviet standards, which are still utilized by the Ukrainian armed forces. While Serbia has not joined Western sanctions against Russia, it has condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine at various international forums. Serbia, however, is neither a member of NATO nor the EU, and its people have long had a sentimental attachment to Russia. Belgrade also counts on Moscow to block international recognition of Kosovo, the former Serbian province recognized by most Western states. And that's all for this episode of Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World.